Uh, good evening to and um, welcome to uh, the evening service of Dewsbury Evangelical Church. Those of you here in the building on this lovely, warm, sunny evening, and to those of you who are joining us online, you're all welcome as we come to worship God. Just briefly, uh, some uh, notices after the service. Um, those are, who are able to help down uh, setting up for the FIC conference here on Tuesday, uh, setting up in the lower hall and the lounge. So if you're able to help with that, then please uh, help with that afterwards. The prayer meeting on Wednesday is here at 7.30, uh, but there will be no Zoom uh, this week, so please note that. And um, yeah, an, an opportunity to... Uh, give towards the um, Brazilian flood disaster. Um, if you want to do that, then you can either put money in the box and mark it uh, for the Brazilian floods, or you can give using the, the church account online. Let's, let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege, again, that's ours to gather together. Uh, this evening, uh, we thank you that we can come and sing your praises, we can pray, we can hear your word, listen to your word, we can share in the Lord's Supper together. Thank you for all these privileges, these means of grace. But Lord, we, we need your help uh, to do all those things. And you know the danger that we have of just going through the motions of of uh, just following a routine. And Lord, we pray that you'd lift us from that and that our worship might be real and we might be dependent upon you and your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing our first uh, song, which is Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning. And when I came in, there was a praise hymn book. I don't know if somebody's put it there specially so I can... So I can um, read out the number. Oh, it's yours, is it? But it's 291 in praise. <laughs> old, old habits die hard. Uh, Christ triumphant, ever reigning.
come to God again in prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, our Father in Heaven, we, we bow before you because you are the, the God of creation, the God of the whole universe, the God who sustains all things, the God who works out all things, who has this great plan and purpose and is accomplishing your purpose. The God who is beyond our imagination and our understanding who is greater than we can know. And yet, you're the God who calls, who tells us to call you our Father. How amazing and how wonderful that is, that you are not the God who is, is distant, that you are not the God who is unapproachable, uh, but you are the one who loves us and has shown your love for us in the most amazing way and who has adopted us into your family and made us your children. Lord, we long that your name would be known throughout this earth. We, we are saddened when we hear uh, your name used wrongly, blasphemed. We are sad that you are ignored and that your commands are ignored and that your gospel truth is sidelined more and more in our own nation particularly. Long, we long that your name would be, would be honoured and glorified and hallowed. We pray that your kingdom would be extended. We thank you that even though it's a day of small things in our own land, nevertheless there are, there are parts of this world where your kingdom grows apace where your kingdom is extended, where the, the, the kingdom of grace is working in the hearts of men and women and, and boys and girls, where many are being brought out of darkness and into the light, out of the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, we pray that you would continue your work and extend your kingdom Call in the elect. We pray that your will will be done and that um, the, those people who come to know you would know the joy and the privilege of knowing the Lord Jesus as their king and ruler. Lord, we thank you that you're concerned about us and that you, uh, the God of, of greatness and glory, uh, is also the God of of our everyday lives and you're the one who provides for us the food that we eat the clothes that we wear the work that we do the money that we spend we thank you that you you are the provider of all these good and perfect gifts help us to acknowledge that to be thankful to give to you the the thanks which is due to recognize that all these things are from your hand from a good god Lord, we, we come before you as sinners. We sin against you as thought and word and deed. We sin against you in the things that we do not think and do and say, as well as the things which are wrong that, that are active. How far short we fall of your glory. And yet you had mercy upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask again that you would forgive us our sins. Thank you that our hope is in the Lord Jesus, in his shed blood upon the cross. Help us to be those who forgive others and not to hold grudges against people, but to forgive others as you forgive us. And Lord, help us in this world, this world of danger, this world where Satan lurks, where he seeks to bring us down and to spoil uh, your name through our lapses, through our falls. Help us, Lord, to, to um, prevail in the, the, the pressures and the, uh, the trials of life. Lord, give us the grace to persevere and uh, to, to know your help and, and strength. Particularly help those who are, uh, going through the mill for whatever reason, maybe those who are unwell, those who 
they've got the stresses of life, maybe their financial difficulties or relationship difficulties or difficulties at work or in the home, those whose love for you <coughs> has grown cold. Lord, would you have mercy? Would you help us, give us the grace that we need to, to keep on keeping on, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, to seek to bring glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, read the scriptures now. It's a short reading this evening, Mark chapter 12, and um, verses 35 to 40. Some ways we could have read the whole chapter, in fact, from near the end of chapter 11. Uh, it's all of a piece. I think it all happened on one day, but we'll... We'll confine ourselves to these few verses. Mark chapter 12, verse 35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. We're not going to even look at all those verses in the passage, uh, but we'll come to that uh, in a few minutes. Let's sing again the song Meekness and Majesty, Manhood and Deity in perfect harmony, the man who is God. We stand to sing.
well, I think at the moment, uh, well, say at the moment, forever, quiz shows seem to have been very popular. I'm not an, an avid follower of quiz shows, but you can't miss things like Pointless and uh, there was a university challenge, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Mastermind, and then there are a lot of others, I think, on at other times. And quiz shows, uh, they've always been popular on TV. When I was a boy, just a few years ago, <laughs> then, then you had um, uh, things like Double Your Money. Do you, does anybody remember that? Anybody as old as me? Oh, yeah, Gwyneth, yeah, there we are. <laughs> Double Your Money and, and Take Your Pick. But the most serious one was on Saturday nights, and it was called The $64,000 Question. And uh, you, you doubled your money as you answered questions, that sort of thing. And uh, as you got to the higher values, then the contestant went into this glass booth and it all made it look sort of high tech and, you know, really, really impressive. But that expression, the $64,000 question, uh, it, I don't know if it, it came in at that point or whether it's been an expression was before that, but it's certainly one that we, we use today, don't we? Particularly when we don't know the answer to some important questions. So, you know, what will be the date of the general election? That's the $64,000 question. Or will Princess Harry and William be reconciled? Well, you might not think that's, that's as important, really, for the $64,000 question. But you get the idea. Now, from the end of chapter 11 in Mark and all through chapter 12, um, though not exactly a quiz show by any means, nevertheless, Jesus had been asked questions all day long. Questions on issues of his authority, Questions about who to pay taxes to. Questions about the reality of the resurrection. And, and the people were amazed at his answers. He would answered so well that we read in verse 34, from then on, uh, Jesus saw that he had, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any questions. But now... Once we get to verse 35, Jesus asked the, question, the, the teachers of the law a question. It had been a full day of questions, but this was the question of the day. This was the $64,000 question. Now, the setting, you remember, was, was the temple. The audience was the teachers of the law, the scribes, the intellectual elite of the day. And they would know the scriptures. They would know the Old Testament. There's no question of them doubting them or finding fault with them. And Jesus associates himself with that. And in quoting from Psalm 110, which he does here in uh, verse um, 36, uh, he's affirming quite clearly what he believes about scripture. The psalm had been written by David. But David was speaking, says there in verse 36, by the Holy Spirit. David was inspired in what he wrote by the Holy Spirit. If the the uh, teachers of the law believe that, Jesus believed that. And Jesus knew that the scribes believed that. They believed that the Old Testament, and so this Psalm 110 was inspired by God. So the scribes wouldn't be able to argue that this man either didn't know the scriptures or if he did, then he didn't believe the scriptures. In asking the question that he did, Jesus was not trying to deny the, the word and prophecy of scripture, but just to raise the crucial issue of its proper meaning. And that also shows us that unlike them and their questions throughout the day, he was not trying to trick them. He was not trying to make them appear foolish. He was not challenging their knowledge of Scripture, but their understanding of Scripture, and particularly on this crucial issue of who the Messiah is. Because on the answer to that question hangs salvation and eternal life. But what is this $64,000 question that Jesus asks? Well, the answer is in two parts. Part one is, is clearly stated for us in verse 35, 
While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, how is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? In other words, what do the scribes mean when they say that the Messiah is the son of David? The fact that the Messiah would be born of David's birth line would have been universally accepted in, in Israel in Jesus' day. The truth is firmly and widely established in the Old Testament. Lots of Old Testament scriptures uh, uh, to tell us this, just a, a, a few of them. Isaiah 11.1, 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Jesse, of course, David's father, King David's father. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. And then finally, Ezekiel 34. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. The Lord will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God, will be a human descendant of David. This was expected. This was a long hope for reality amongst the Jewish people. On this they could all agree. The Christ is David's son, and therefore human, a man. Part two of the answer to this vital question needs a bit more thinking about. And this is where Jesus takes his hearers and us to Psalm 110. Now we've already seen that the, the, the scribes and Jesus accept the divine inspiration of this psalm. And uh, verse 1, which is quoted here. And it's actually quoted uh, an amazing 33 times in the New Testament, including, of course, this morning in Acts chapter 2, uh, in Peter's sermon that Mark was preaching. Now, in some of the older Bibles, um, and particularly the authorised Bible, then the meaning, I think, would be perhaps a bit clearer, because the first Lord, right, we've got the Lord set to my Lord, particularly at that point at the moment, that first Lord will be printed in capitals because it refers to God, Yahweh. And the second Lord, as here, will be in lowercase because it refers to the king and is the word Adonai. So what we have here in verse 1 of Psalm 110 is David recording a declaration from God the Lord, Yahweh, to the future king, his Lord, Adonai. <coughs> now, where have we got to? The Messiah, the Christ, would be a human person descended from David. But he would also be someone whom David would call his Lord, his Adonai, his sovereign, his king. Everyone agrees on that. But they hadn't, it seems, thought what the implication of that was. And so in, in verse 37, David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? It's really at that point that Jesus, that, that, um, uh, Jesus asked, asked the second part of this great question. How can, if David calls him Lord, how then can be his son? You see, there's a cultural matter here uh, for the Jews which posed a big problem. A father in Jewish culture would never refer to his son with a title of superiority. In Jewish culture, the son is always subordinate to his father. Why would David refer to his future descendant as Lord? In fact, how can David's son be David's Lord, the Messiah? Now, Jesus is not trying to tell them that that's not possible, but he's prompting them to consider that the Messiah is far greater than what they were expecting. Because the Jews, remember, they were expecting a descendant of King David to free them from the rule of the Romans and restore the kingdom and sovereignty of Israel. 
But this king, this son of David, instead of triumphing over the Romans, he died the death of a slave. And that death became the king's victory. That's what we're remembering in the Lord's Supper. The promised Messiah will be far superior to King David. David would worship and submit to him as his Lord. There can only be one explanation of how that can be possible. The Messiah is both human and divine. And Jesus is claiming to be that person. And the large crowd, we read there at verse 35, 37, the large crowd listened to him with delight. Maybe it was the whole dialogue throughout the whole day uh, that they were listening to, but it climaxes in this $64,000 question. But did they understand really what Jesus was saying? Because they, along with the scribes, they needed to come to the same conclusion that Jesus is both man and God. And there's plenty of evidence of that in Jesus' life. But the scribes and Pharisees, they were blind to it. The New Testament writers clearly affirm this great truth that Jesus is both man and God. He is the God-man. And I want us to think about his person just for our remaining time, just for a few minutes. Because as we share communion together, there can be no better preparation to think about him and his perfect suitableness to be our saviour. Because the devil will always do everything he can to downplay this great truth, the person of Jesus. Either to see Jesus as only a man, maybe a good man, maybe a perfect man, but just a man. Or to minimize the majesty and the glory and the power and the deity of Jesus in our minds. And the more we downplay Jesus, the less we look up to and worship and adore him. Let's just think about his deity for a minute or two. Think of the names given to the Lord Jesus Christ. God himself refers to him audibly as my son. He's described as the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, obviously terms of deity. He's the Lord, as we have seen, and the Lord of glory. Thomas refers to him as my Lord and my God. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And in Titus 2.13, he is our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then there are the divine attributes or characteristics which are ascribed to Jesus. Hebrews 1.3, we read, He upholds all things by the word of his power. In other words, he's all-powerful. He is omnipotent. And then when many, many people saw the miraculous signs that he did and believed in him, he said in, in John 2, he knew what they were thinking and he wouldn't entrust himself to them. He knew all things. Omniscient. And then you remember his well-known words in Matthew 18, for where two or three are gathered together, there I am with them. The everywhere present, omnipresence. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. Characteristic, uh, the attributes of God, but yet also characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is God. And then he says he's always been, always the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Paul says in Colossians 2, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives bodily in him. And then think of the things that only God can do. Jesus claimed the power to forgive the sins of the paralyzed man let down there through the roof. Remember that? He raised several people from the dead. The widow of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter, and of course Lazarus. And judgment is committed to Jesus Christ. And there's the Lord Jesus' own self-consciousness and claims. When he was only 12 and in the temple, he had to be about his father's business. And in the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, the devil said, if you are the son of God, 
And Jesus never said that he was not. He accepted the devil's statement and then went on to prove to him that he was the Son of God. And Jesus' own claim to deity also comes through in his calling and empowering his disciples and in the way in which he contrasts what the people had heard long ago with what he said was the fuller meaning there in the Sermon on the Mount. Finally, his claim that before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was the great I am. And yet it was the great I am who went to the cross. Is that not truly amazing? Jesus Christ is God. But we've also robustly to defend his humanity. Jesus is a man. Jesus was born of Mary in the normal way. He was a helpless, dependent baby, needing all the care that every baby needs. He had a real human body. And then look at the names, 1 Timothy 2, the man Christ Jesus. One of the commonest descriptions of Jesus in the Gospels is the Son of Man. Jesus had a typical human physical nature. The Word became flesh and lived amongst us. And you remember the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well? He looked like a typical Jew. She says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman. She had no idea who he was. But when she spoke, when he spoke, she recognized that he was a Jew. And after the resurrection, Jesus was anxious to prove to Thomas that he was the same person as before. Reach into my hands, he said, and sighed. He still had a truly human body. And then in his humanity, there was growth and development. We read he grew in wisdom and stature. But yet there were limits to his knowledge. He didn't know the day or hour of the end and of his return in glory. And his physical frame was limited. We knew that he grew weary and tired and needed to sleep. He knew hunger and thirst. He knew physical agony in the garden and on the cross. And he died. He literally died and was buried. This physical limitation is the ultimate proof of his humanity. At times he was moved with compassion and he expressed righteous anger, emotions that we know, though our anger is often not righteous. There's so much to say, but I'll leave it with the fact that he was tempted like we are, but didn't give in to that sin and sin. He prayed often. He wanted to pray. He needed to pray. And if he needed to pray, then how much more so ourselves. He was made like us in every way, but yet without sin. And he claimed to be sinless. He said, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Jesus was a fully human being in every way, but without sin. We can only conclude that the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is both God and man. And in trying to understand that and illustrate his dual nature, it's very easy to get it wrong. There have been many heresies in the history of the church because of a wrong understanding. And now is not the place for me to attempt to try and do that. We just have to accept his dual nature. He is both God and man. And at the end of the day, that is what faith is. We believe what the Bible teaches here concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. We can't understand it. We don't know how it can be that Jesus can have a human nature and be God at the same time. It's a great and a wonderful and a glorious mystery. But one that we've been allowed to look into. We cannot understand it, but we can rest in the glorious truth that we have in Jesus Christ, one who is perfectly fitted to be our saviour, to rescue us from the guilt and the penalty of our sin. No one could bear the penalty of human sin except someone who is human himself. And in his sufferings, he's a sympathetic high priest, tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He was sinless. And if that had not been the case, 
we could not eat and drink, remembering a spotless Savior. He suffered the agonies of death for us, his body broken, his blood shed. But yet it's equally necessary that our Savior be God, that his sacrifice might have infinite value, that he might render perfect obedience to God without failure or any possibility of failure. He had to be God. The Father's just and perfect wrath needed to be satisfied and sin's penalty paid. And the message of the gospel and the essence of our communion service is that God so loved you and me that his son came into the world to do this. Though he was eternal, he went into the womb of Mary and was born a baby and put into an animal's feeding trough, still eternal. The son by whom all things are made. And then at the end of his life was spat upon and crucified and died and was buried. And he did it all because it was the only way that you and I could be saved. The only way that our sins could be forgiven was that he should bear their punishment. The only way that you and I could become partakers of the divine nature was that he should have a human nature. And having done that, he is able to give us this new nature and prepare us for heaven and for glory. This is what Jesus has done. And my prayer is that God would help us all to grasp more and more the marvel of his person and the enormity of all that he has done to save us, that we may love him more. Amen. Well, before we come to the Lord's Supper, we're going to, to sing again a song which is appropriate as we think about all that we've been thinking about and as we pray. Prepare for the Lord's Supper. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me. Though he was pure, a lamb without a blemish, he took my sins and nailed them to the tree. We stand to sing.
Well, let's stand to sing our, our final hymn. Name of all majesty, fathomless mystery, king of the angels by angels, sorry, king of the ages by angels adored, power and authority, splendor and dignity, bow to his mastery. Jesus is Lord. Let's stand to sing. read a few verses from Revelation chapter 5 to close our service. And I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand ten times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Amen. Amen. <laughs>